In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. This is the beautiful mystery of the Incarnation, God putting on flesh, God setting up camp here with His people. God sending those people on mission, serving the world. God inviting us to see, to touch, to know what it is to be His body. A body that was flesh and blood, a body that was broken for us. This is the story of God made flesh and what that means for those who want to follow him. This is the story of Jesus, incarnate, putting flesh on the ways and words of Jesus by getting skin in the game. Uh, so it's been now a couple weeks since we started this conversation, incarnate, putting flesh on the ways and words of Jesus by getting skin in the game. But if you were with us for the the first week of this series, you might remember that I told you about my first real celebrity encounter as a teenager when I was just mere feet from Indiana basketball icon Reggie Miller. What I didn't tell you about as we began this series, however, is the time several years before that when I saw my first grade teacher in the aisle at the grocery store, which for a first grader kind of has that same celebrity appeal, right? Like, and Mrs. Scott was very kind. She visited with my mom in the aisle for a few minutes and then went about her shopping. And as she left, I found myself uh, just uncontrollably breaking down into tears with nerves or something. I couldn't explain it. I didn't understand it. And I remember my mom trying to help me understand. they like, teachers are real people too. They have to grocery shop, you know. Um, it, was a whole, it was a whole thing. Um, and uh, that wasn't the, the, the last time, though, that Mrs. Scott would teach me something about humanness. Um, it was at the height of cold and flu season. And in a first grade classroom, you can imagine what that means. Lots of drippy noses, lots of nasty coughs. And it seems that our classroom had run out of all the superhero and Care Bears themed boxes of Kleenex tissue that we brought as part of our supply list on back to school night. And so Mrs. Scott called me up to her desk to send me on an errand, okay? Now, some of you remember what it was like for the teacher to single you out and ask you to go on a mission for them and how it was kind of a big deal, right? Like, there was a certain cachet that came with that. There was a certain level of trust that came with that. Now, some of you have no idea what we're talking about, right? Because you went through school and your experience with the teachers was such they were never going to unleash you on the halls unsupervised, And someday, Everett, I hope you can tell us how that felt. But for the rest of us, some of you might remember, like, the way it was when the teacher asked you, come help me out, right? And so Mrs. Scott called me up to the desk, and she said, I need you to go to the office. I need you to do me a favor. And she sent me to the office for a roll of toilet paper. Uh, Now... I was fine going, right? Because there's that cachet. The teacher sends you on a mission. But as I made my way to the office, I began to get very nervous. And I began to sweat bullets. It wasn't so much going. It was the idea of going into the office and asking the school secretary if I could have a roll of toilet paper. And then having to carry said roll of toilet paper all the way back down the hallway to the classroom. 
And so amidst my nervousness on the way to the office, I came up with a plan, right? When I got to the office, I stopped just before the door of the office. I just kind of hung out against the wall for a minute. I waited. And then I turned around and made my way back to the classroom empty-handed, went to Mrs. Scott's desk and told her that the office said they were out of toilet paper. I didn't tell you it was a good plan, right? I just told you I came up with a plan. Uh, as you might imagine, she did not buy that. And I'm sure my red-faced demeanor indicated that something more was afoot. And so she sent me back to the office to retrieve that roll of toilet paper. And I remember vividly carrying it down the hallway, afraid of what anybody might think. What, what if they see me carrying toilet paper in the hallway? What will they think? And so I distinctly remember trying to kind of tuck it up uh, 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 like in the inside of my arm so that maybe nobody could see it. And I was a scrawny little kid, okay? And so I can only imagine it had to look like what might it look like if I were trying to hide behind a telephone hole pole playing hide-and-seek with my kids these days, you know, and just be like... It wasn't working, okay? So I make my way back, and I give Mrs. Scott the toilet paper, and I was mortified. Now, some of you are like, great, I'm glad we have this venue for you, Pastor, to kind of work out your childhood traumas. But it's more than that. Because I'm convinced, guys, that a key element of what it means to follow the ways and words of Jesus is to understand that we have been sent on mission. We have been given an errand by Jesus. And at first, when we think about that, it can be the kind of thing that we go, huh, that's pretty cool. Like, Jesus is trusting me to do his stuff. Feels like it comes with a little bit of cachet. The teacher has sent us on a mission. But as time goes on, it can be easy for us then to begin to get a little embarrassed, to wonder what people might think of us as we go on mission for Jesus. And I wonder at times if it doesn't cause some of us to, to begin to carry our faith like an awkward roll of toilet paper kind of tucked up, hoping against hope that no one asks too many questions. As we began this conversation about Jesus being incarnate, we, we noted how it's easy for us to get so used to the idea of God coming and walking among us in the person of Jesus that we start to, to do the exact opposite of what the incarnation is really all about. And we start to think of Jesus as out there somewhere, this, this spiritual reality that is somewhat disconnected from everyday life. Right? We, we can begin to, to see the pursuit of faith, pursuit of the ways and words of Jesus as this ethereal, spiritual kind of pursuit, and we aren't always sure how it really impacts life on the ground. <clears throat> But what if, <clears throat> excuse me, what if the key to our sentness lies in this notion of God entering himself into the world in order to reveal himself to the world? To, to, to come near, to involve himself in the day to day life of humanity. show you what I mean to, to get our conversation rolling this morning, I want to invite us to step back into John's gospel. Only this time we're going to jump into the end of John's gospel rather than the beginning where we were a couple of weeks ago. If you're following along in the YouVersion Bible app, you can find all the teaching notes and things there for you today if it's helpful to jot some things down, fill in some blanks. Scripture will be here on the screen for you. <clears throat> Excuse me, this isn't starting well, fellas. All right, well, uh, we'll press ahead. John chapter 20, we're going to begin in verse 19. 
where we read this. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we step into this scene, and it's the, the evening of the very first Easter. Now, the way that John has described the day for us up to this point, by all accounts, the disciples have not yet encountered the risen Christ. Uh, according to, to John's timeline, some of them had gone to the tomb to investigate the reports that his body was missing. They had heard from Mary Magdalene that she had seen the Lord. But to this point, John has not told us of a moment when Jesus encountered his disciples after the resurrection. And so here it is, evening of the first day of the week, and John tells us the disciples are together in one place with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews. So, see, they, they, they were afraid that the same Jewish leaders that had arrested, tried, and executed Jesus may now be coming after them. That is the reason why the doors are locked. I believe, though, John has another purpose for why he emphasizes the fact that the doors are locked. Why he tells us about the disciples' security methods on that first Easter evening. Because as they are gathered in one place with the doors locked for the fear of the Jews, John says, suddenly Jesus stood among them. The doors are still locked. The disciples are still essentially hunkered down in hiding. And Jesus stands in their midst. And Jesus, in this moment, greets them before showing them his hands, showing him his side, indicating for them that the same man who had hung on the cross just days before was now standing in their midst. Not as a ghost, not as a spirit, not as a vision, not as a spiritual reality disconnected from everyday life, but the incarnate Jesus raised from the dead. His flesh intact but changed. His mission completed, but yet still unchanged. And Jesus comes to them and says, peace be with you. Now on the surface, that's just a, a colloquial Jewish greeting. A form of it is still in use today. Jesus simply appears and says, peace be to you. But if we look a layer down and we, we dig beneath the surface a bit, Jesus' words here are also strangely reminiscent in the way that they echo scenes that we see scattered across the Old Testament. When a figure known as the angel of the Lord, this mysterious being who seems to show up at these big moments in the life of God's people, who, who seems to represent God and speak on his behalf at times in the first person. The angel of the Lord, when he appeared throughout the Old Testament, would begin the conversation saying, peace to you. 
reassuring the person that he is addressing, the people that he is addressing, that, that they do not need to fear this spiritual being that has appeared in a way they can't explain. Here is Jesus on the first day of the week, raised from the dead, and appears with the same sort of greeting from the angel of the Lord to say, peace be with you. Now, I think we should assume that perhaps their response was less than peaceful because he shows them his hands and his side, and then he immediately repeats those words. No, no. <laughs> Peace be with you. <laughs> he reassures them a second time and adds these words, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Now, if, if we have been reading John closely up to this point, some things will begin to resonate in our minds. If we've been reading John closely, we will begin to, to understand some, some ways in which Jesus' words here in John 20 echo some things we've heard throughout the gospel. We won't take the time to look at all of them, but, but I want to give us a, a quick snapshot of what is happening here in these words. Throughout John's gospel, Jesus has often referred to the Father as the one who sent me. Jesus has repeatedly defined his mission, his ministry, in terms of doing the will of him who sent me. From the way that John relays Jesus' life and ministry, the key core idea for Jesus in his understanding of who he is, is as one who has been sent from the Father. All the way through the gospel, we bump into this kind of self-description from Jesus. And this is especially true for us as we get into what we might call Jesus' farewell address in John's chapter 13 through 17, this conversation Jesus has the night of his arrest with his disciples. We hear lots of echoes from that conversation in Jesus' words here in John 20. Okay? Uh, in John chapter 17, as Jesus prays for the disciples, he explicitly says to the Father, I am sending them into the world in the way you have sent me into the world. Jesus, in that conversation in John chapter 15, first mentions the Holy Spirit, who he describes this way, the Holy Spirit who my Father will send in my name. When Jesus appears this Easter night and says, peace, be with you. And the response of the disciples is described as being overjoyed. We should intentionally remember the night of his arrest. He told them, I will be taken from you, but I will return to you to give you my peace so that your grief, your mourning will turn to joy and celebration. John is very carefully echoing this conversation Jesus had had with them just days before in the way that he describes what Jesus says to them in this moment. There are so many echoes in just these short little passage of a few verses. And we're not going to get super nerdy and track them all down like we could spend a lot of time doing that, but we're not going to, okay? So to catch your breath, it's okay. But I do want us to look at one that I think will specifically help us Understand this notion of sentness as key to Jesus' incarnation. I want to put it on the screen for you and read it from here uh, because it gets a little obscured in translation. But Jesus, in John chapter 13, told the disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who receives anyone I send receives me. And the one who receives me receives the one who sent me. Okay, so Jesus uh, frames uh, the, the sending of his people in terms 
of people who will receive them are receiving Jesus, and to receive Jesus is to receive the One who sent Him, the Father. And as followers of Jesus, we can know who has sent us. Sometimes we can feel unsure how people might respond. You ever been in that moment? You you know Jesus has sent you on mission into the world. You know that you carry the good news. But you're unsure how people might respond. You're unsure whether people will receive Jesus, but oftentimes what we're really concerned about is will they receive us? We're unsure what people would think of us and whether they will not just simply receive Jesus, but would they receive us as one who carries the good news of Jesus? after the conversation we've just been digging into about the way that John is echoing his words. It probably won't surprise you to, to hear that there's another echo from the very beginning of the Gospel of John. This idea that we saw in the first week of this series together, that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He came to the world that was His own. And His own did not receive Him. But John follows that statement up in chapter 1 to say, but to all who would receive Him, He gave the power to become children of God. So from the, from the get-go, John has put this idea of sending and receiving into his message about Jesus so that we make clear our understanding that Jesus, when He is received, has the power to save. Oftentimes, I think we carry the message of Jesus, this message of God made flesh, feeling the weight of responsibility for people to receive Jesus and a fear that they will reject us in the process. But the mystery of the incarnation itself is that God Himself came to reveal Himself. And not all received him. Now, did that mean that Jesus wasn't sent? When John says he came to his own, but his own received him not, does that change whether the Father has sent Jesus to reveal his glory? No, it doesn't. And it doesn't change Jesus' aim, his goal to reveal the Father full of grace and truth. But I think if we take the incarnation seriously, it means that the sense that Jesus came and walked among us and some would not receive Him carried with it the very human emotion of rejection. And I don't know about you, but I find some hope in that. I find some hope in this mystery of the incarnation that God Himself came and walked among us and some did not receive Him. I think what we have to get our minds around, it's there in the teaching notes if you want to jot some things down and fill in the blanks. We'll have it for you on the screen here. Sent by Jesus. We're not responsible for how people receive Jesus, but for how we represent Jesus. Once we understand that we are sent by Jesus, we're not responsible for the way in which people receive Jesus. We are responsible for how we represent Jesus. 
for, for the way in which we, do we represent him faithfully? Do we add a bunch of stuff that, that kind of gets in the way of Jesus? Sometimes we, we know that we're sent by Jesus and we carry this weight because we're not sure how people will respond. Our responsibility as ones sent by Jesus is to represent Him well. We are sent. As the Father sent Jesus, Jesus sends His people full of grace and truth to be light shining in the darkness, revealing the glory of the one and only. As sentness is our mission. But success is not our responsibility. That, that is above our pay grade. That is beyond our ability. But it doesn't change that sentness is our mission. Because the mystery of the incarnation is that, is that it, even God the, in the flesh came and walked among us and not everyone would receive Him. In fact, the Gospels make clear, some crucified Him. I don't know about you, but that feels like it takes a lot of pressure off. That I can understand that I have been sent by Jesus, but I'm not responsible for how people receive Jesus. I'm responsible for how I represent Him. How do, how do I communicate love that Jesus has for people. So what are we sent for? I think here in John 20, on the evening of the first day of the week, the very first Easter, uh, John gives us uh, a twofold sense of what the mission is. With all this talk of sending and receiving, probably shouldn't surprise us that Jesus then breathes on them. And says, receive the Holy Spirit. And if we've been tracking with John in the way that he tries to echo his descriptions of Jesus and what he's doing, it shouldn't surprise us that we hear another round of echoes. Now, if, if you were with us for week one, you, you might remember that we said John opens his gospel with all these echoes from the creation story. Right In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And all things were made through Him. Let there be and there was. There's all of these intentional kinds of echoes back to the creation account in Genesis chapter 1. Now here, in John chapter 20, we get echoes not of Genesis 1, but of Genesis chapter 2. So let's look at, it, look at this very briefly here. Genesis chapter 2, listen to verse 7. So the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Throughout both the Old and the New Testaments, the, the word for spirit is the word for breath. So it's perhaps fair to say in Genesis 2, God breathes His Spirit into humanity. And humankind becomes a living being. The Spirit, the breath, the life of God. And John does something here at the end of his Gospel to bring all of this full circle. In John chapter 19, we won't take the time to, to read the passage at length, but it's the, the account of Jesus' crucifixion. And as the day wears on, and Jesus' life is slipping away, you may remember John tells us in chapter 19 that he cries out in a loud voice. It is finished. 
And with that, he breathes his last. And John's very, very next words are intentionally, intentionally chosen. He reminds us on the heels of Jesus' physical death, now the very next day was the Sabbath. Now listen to, John, or to Genesis chapter 2 in verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work He had been doing, so on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. And there, God goes on to bless the Sabbath day, the day that He rested from His labors. On the sixth day, On a Friday, God finished His work. And He blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And John tells us here, some several thousand years later, that again on a Friday, God finished His work and was laid in the tomb rest for the Sabbath. And now, on the first day of the week, Jesus greets His disciples. He breathes on them. He says, receive the Holy Spirit. God, once more, on a brand new week of creation, breathes life into humanity. And there Jesus tells the disciples this this odd line that always throws us, right? We're not sure what to do with this. He says, if you forgive anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them. If you retain their sins, they are retained. And we aren't entirely sure what to do with that most of the time. We don't have the time to unpack it today, right? For 2,000 years, the church has come up with several different answers, and not everybody agrees on it. But I think what becomes clear for us is there's something in this sending by Jesus, who was sent by the Father, full of grace and truth, to reveal the glory of the one and only, that tells us Jesus is somehow conveying the redemptive authority that has been conveyed to Him. Because the Spirit has inaugurated new creation. We should not see here in Jesus' words about the forgiveness of sins the power to hold guilt over people. But rather the opportunity to extend grace to people, to announce to them that new life and redemption is possible. That is the message with which we have been sent. I would put it like this for us. Again, it's there in the notes if it's helpful. Brought to new life by the Holy Spirit and sent by Jesus, we are to announce the availability of redemption and the arrival of new creation. We are brought to life by the Spirit, sent by Jesus to announce the availability of redemption, that that sin can be forgiven, we can be set free, and the arrival of new creation. And that, that is a message worth carrying regardless of the response. That is a hope worth announcing no matter how it is received, because John has told us from the outset, for all who will receive it, it holds the power of eternal life. I invite the band to come back. We're going to close out our time and worship together. 
as we, as the followers of Jesus, have been sent on mission by the master, by the teacher, with the very thing everyone around us desperately needs. The good news of Jesus is death and resurrection. And sometimes we can lose sight of that sentence amidst our fear of what people might think, how they might respond, how they might or might not receive Jesus. But if we're honest, our bigger fear is how they might or might not receive us. But announcing the availability of redemption Announcing the arrival of God's new creation doesn't leave us responsible for how Jesus is received. Only for how we represent Him as ones who have been sent. So carry the hope high. You have been entrusted by the master, by the teacher, with a mission of eternal importance. Let's pray together.